So this talk today uh, is about the jeweler's art, revolutionary jewelry from the 60s and 70s. This is also the title of the exhibition that's on now in Diva at the moment for two more weeks. I am the creator uh, of Diva, the Museum of Diamonds, Jewelry and Silver in Antwerp. And uh, with us today are uh, Kimberly Klosterman. Uh, she is a wonderful woman wearing a beautiful uh, Sotelis uh, necklace today. And she is a huge jewelry lover and collector. She has a very big um, collection of uh, the big names like um, uh, Cartier, uh, Bulgari, and uh, all the others, but also, and that's what most of the time we're going to talk about today, uh, artist jewelers. And um, this exhibition uh, was made together with the Cincinnati Art Museum in Cincinnati, also where uh, Kimberly lives, but also where the Cincinnati Art Museum is, and the chief curator and curator of fashion, Cynthia Amis. And she um, has worked for uh, a number of years together with Kimberly on this exhibition, did a lot of research uh, and found out wonderful things and new information. Uh, we will talk about uh, at the end about the wonderful book they made, the big catalog. Um, but before we will talk with Lisa Eisner, uh, she has a um, yeah, you, uh, a very big uh, background in fashion. Uh, and then uh, she was very interested in also accessories and uh, started to photograph people. And um, she also started to collect jewelry. And now she is a very well-known jewelry designer herself and has uh, inspiration from um, the 1960s and 70s. So now you all have a little bit an idea of uh, who is with us today. Um, and I will let, show you a few pictures first of uh, the exhibition that's now on at Diva. Um, this is the first room. Uh, the inspiration was a, a, a film. We will talk about it later. Um, and this is more jewelry of the 1960s, very bold and colorful and big inspiration from nature, uh, wild gold as they uh, used, uh, a term is very much used and uh, big uncut uh, uh, and unpolished uh, stones and uh, minerals. And then the second room is really about uh, um, uh, newspapers, articles, uh, recipes, all those kind of things that remind you, oh, this is this was what happened uh, in the 1960s and 70s to give a bit of a context um, and also fashion uh, uh, and design of this period of time. And then um, you will enter uh, a light show, uh, Transito it's called, designed by uh, Children of the Light in Beyond Space, it's called now, but before they used uh, um, Space Encounters. And uh, it's really as if you enter the space age, it's moving light, I will show you a video later. And we have some real space age jewelry in this room as well, we will talk about it too. And then the last room, uh, really about more 70s design, uh, really about the future, futuristic view, uh, well, they already went to the moon, so what else was have, uh, possible and uh, what might the future bring, but also um, uh, you see fashion uh, of Paco Rabanne and at the back two dresses for, uh, designed by Belgian sculptor and artist um, Felix Roulin. And uh, we added those dresses from the collection of our uh, colleagues, the Fashion Museum Momi uh, in Antwerp, uh, because the showcase at the back, you will see jewelry that was designed by artists. Um, but we are here not only to talk about the exhibition, uh, but also about all the beautiful jewelry, or not all of it, but most of it that's in there. And uh, I would like to um, give Kimberly uh, um, attention to talk about this beautiful necklace 
and why it's so important for you. Thanks, Catherine. And I, I thank you everybody for coming today. This is really exciting to have people to share with. And I must say, if you do have an opportunity to see the exhibition since it's up for just a couple of weeks, please go. I can't, and it's breaking my heart. So I just wanna start by saying that. Um, and this piece is in the exhibition. It's on the cover of the book that accompanies the exhibition as well. And it is by Jean Vendôme and quite a departure from a lot of necklaces and jewelry I have in the collection because most of it is yellow gold. And this almost reaches between the, the area of, um, to, to high jewelry. Uh, it becomes more of a necklace that you would wear for a special occasion. But as you can see, not it's it's so it's so incredibly um, forward thinking from what jewelry was happening in the 1950s, which was very staid and symmetrical and flat to the neck. And here you have these wonderful Vera Cruz amethysts poking out of this necklace. And, uh, you know, th they look like icicles and it just feels like a, a, a wintry icicle necklace, but um, it's, it's, what else do I want to say? I want to also point out that the, the pendant hangs asymmetrically off the side of it. Um, the crystals, of course, were things that weren't extremely valuable at the time, but they were collected by people that liked crystals and rocks and minerals and things like this. And Jean Vendôme was a, a huge fan of unusual materials and minerals. And I think this really points that up and you will see other people also in the collection that use these unusual stones in very many different ways. So, um, oh, and, and um, I bought the necklace not so long ago and uh, Thierry Vendôme, who is Jean's son, became uh, an acquaintance of mine. So I showed Thierry the necklace and I said, Thierry, so tell me about this necklace. And he said, he couldn't believe that I had it. He said, you have that necklace? We've been looking all over for that necklace. And um, he said, this is a very, very, very important piece. It was never supposed to leave France. And there was an American woman that wanted to buy it in, 19, in the early 1970s. And my father was asked by Roger Calois, it begged by Roger Calois, please don't sell this necklace. It's too important and it cannot leave France. And so Vendôme did not sell the necklace. Um, however, shortly after he was in a car accident, a very bad car accident and put in the hospital for, I believe it was a year, maybe longer, maybe a little bit less, but quite a long time. And um, Thierry told me that his mother had to pay hospital bills. And so she phoned the American collector and the American collector purchased the necklace and this helped to pay for the bills. And today we still don't know who that American collector is. I purchased it at auction. So I don't have any better provenance than that. So I get every opportunity I can to, to ask everybody out there, do they know who the American woman was, because it would be lovely to have the provenance for this piece. But so um, please, if you do know, <laughs> put it in the chat. Uh, it would be lovely if uh, we have an answer after this, uh, if, after this talk. And um, before we go to the next slide, Kimberly, you already mentioned a few characteristics about this necklace. And uh, those are also like the big stones, the colorful, the uh, unpolished um, minerals. The big stones asymmetrical are very um, characteristics of the uh, 1960s and 70s, as well as the use of, well, let's say quite unusual materials. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and about Gilbert? Sure. Sure, and Gilbert Albert is another um, great favorite of mine. And I, I think there are some people that really shine in the collection and, and uh, Vendôme is one in, in France, working in France, working in Paris. Gilbert Albert is Swiss. And um, he worked with both Patek Philippe and also um, uh, uh, Patek and Omega before he opened his own, his own shop, but, and, and for a number of other people. 
th this is exciting because this is a one man show that he had at Goldsmiths Hall. And he showed here, as you can see, meteorite jewelry. So this was a, a new thing that um, only a very few people were doing. Gibert Albert absolutely loved meteorites and all things from outer space. And uh, so here's a necklace and a ring that we have in the collection and it's being shown at Diva as well. And even though these aren't meteorites, they're related to meteorites because they're moldavites. And moldavite is a glass-like substance that when a meteorite does hit the earth, uh, it creates this wonderful olivine green glass-like uh, stone. And so that's what these pieces are. And I do want to point out that this necklace and that the pearls would be Biwa pearls, the long skinny stick pearls and um, from like Biwa in Japan. And then the um, necklace itself reaches about down to your, almost to your navel. Um, so it's, wow. it's quite, quite a long and impressive piece. And during that time, you have to think, well, how would that be worn? Well, if you think a lot of the, the waist, the hem, the waistlines were dropped. So you get a lot of longer things. Um, caftans were in fashion. Um, you know, you, you can imagine just wearing this casually to a party or dinner. And that's how jewelry was worn quite a bit. Can I just throw in too that, you know, one of the things that we saw in the Vendome piece and we see <clears throat> as we go through is how sculptural this work is. So Vendome really thought about his work as sculpture and we see, saw that in that necklace. But as we go through, we'll see that a lot of these artists, jewelers, artist jewelers really were interested in creating things that were very sculptural. Yes, and you can see also in the ring that's in the middle, but also in the necklace as well, they use their gold differently than the very smooth um, way and polished way uh, you saw before and also uh, later on. Here they use the term of it's called wild gold or um, where you can really see as if, yeah, they believe that they could make jewelry that it was just as if it was to be found in nature as it was not so polished and like they used the kind of gold nuggets in their form and uh, uh, yeah, it's not, not very polished, but in wild forms as the night and day would say. Um, then the next slide is about uh, Roger Lucas, <coughs> a Canadian um, designer. Uh, he worked for Cartier too, which was very special uh, in a way. Kimberly, can you tell us about that? Well, I think it's interesting because um, Cynthia brought up that, uh, you know, these things are sculptural. And if you just read in this, this the piece on the um, article that's shown on the screen is from Roger's personal scrapbook. And uh, the first sentence is, it's an object. It happens to be a ring, but it could be 30 feet high and span a boulevard because I'm a designer first and a jeweler second. And I think, you know, that kind of sums up where a lot of people, um, where a lot of artist jewelers heads were and coming up with even the term artist jeweler, how are we going to sort of couch all this jewelry and, and, and how are we going to, you know, fit it into history? Artist jewelers seem to make sense because they made one of a kind pieces very often and um, not just that, but they were they were sculptural. The jewelers themselves thought of themselves as um, artists, but jewelry was their medium. So not like an artist that paints and then makes jewelry. It's kind of a, an artist, but using gold as their medium. So um, and and also marketing it in a very traditional way as well. Well, except for. Roger Lucas, who did sail around the sea and go from port to port and um, sell to his jet set clientele. So he, he was a little bit different, but um, these, I wanna show these rings though, they're wonderful. One is um, on uh, the one on the left is about his sea travels and about those journeys. And he loved the ocean and he was a great diver. And these are sea anemone 
And this is a two finger ring that the press at the time called a knuckle buster. This was done in 1969 and retailed at Cartier. And uh, Cartier in New York gave Roger a one man show then. And that was really exciting. And that's what Cart when Cartier first started breaking out into working with a host of artist jewelers and Roger was the first one of that, that group. So um, this has both of those marks. And then the ring on the right is his astronaut ring. And um, the space age was very important during that time as well. In 69, we had the first man land on the moon. And this is a direct reflection of that, that ring uh, or that, uh, that moon landing. And um, I think it was funny because when Catherine and, and when we were talking earlier, Catherine said, oh, well, the meteorite jewelry is space age jewelry too. And I had never looked at it that way, but I thought that was such a great observation because it really was. And, uh, and also, you know, a part of our nature, a, a, every part of it. So that's, uh, these are- a Can I say something about this um, gold thing? Um, because, you know, there are these theories, which I like, that gold um, came from outer space, that it was like a big gold meteorite that hit the earth because there's a lot of people who think that they can't actually find where it came from. So I like to think that some big gold meteorite hit the earth and like all this gold just sort of happens. So it sort of goes in with our space age, you know, fantasy thing. Cool, <laughs> I'll, I'll buy it. I'll buy it, <laughs> I like it. Great, thank you for... Um adding this to this nice story. Um, um, before we go to, to you, Lisa, uh, I would like to um, have Kimberly's uh, story about this one brooch of uh, Arthur King. Um, you said, well, I did a very nice uh, uh, discovery just when I sent out the jewelry already to, to your museum. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So. Um... Arthur King is a huge fan of mine, and Arthur King worked in New a fan of mine. I'm a huge fan of his. <laughs> he might be a fan of mine. I don't know. He's long gone, but I think we have a connection. At any rate, um, Arthur worked predominantly in New York, but he had he had a shop in, in he had stores in uh, Miami Beach, in Cuba, uh, at Fortnum and Mason in London, um, and uh, sold during the uh, late 50s, early 60s, and well into the 70s and early 80s. And this particular piece came to the Diva Show because we were not able to travel some of the ivory, unfortunately. Um, so this piece came on sort of towards at the last minute. And it's a wonderful piece. And I wanna point out that the stone is unusual. It's a, I think it's a chrysocolla. I think that's what the stone is, um, which a lot of people think it might be turquoise, but it, it doesn't really have that color. And then the stones around it, which are very interesting, are um, colored diamonds, and they wouldn't be naturally colored that way. They would be, be irradiated. So the materials were not expensive materials, but they were treated in a lavish way. And Arthur also always used these little whiplash tendrils in his jewelry and other people did that too, but Arthur really did it well. I mean, they are beautiful, they're elegant. There's just something special about those little tendrils. And um, so anyway, the, the piece goes to Diva and I'm looking through the Andy Warhol collection catalogs that I've had around for a while and lo and behold, I find in the upper left-hand corner of the catalog that it was owned by Andy Warhol. So it was fun to find that provenance and know that uh, Andy and I have the same taste. <laughs> and also something again, that what you said, it's not really the materials or, or the value of the materials that was attracted by these designers, but more the visual uh, aspect of it and the way it looked. Yes, yeah, very nice. and. Um, well, let's continue and um, uh, have Lisa Eisner, a uh, jewelry designer at the moment. Do you think you do you call yourself most now a jewelry designer or still? Yeah, yes, uh, definitely a jewelry designer, yes. 
and very inspired by the 60s and 70s uh, as well. Um, would you like us? Uh, would you like to talk about that already? Or um... sure, sure. I mean, um, I moved to California about 35 years ago, and I'm a flea marketer and vintage girl. And one of the things I would always find in the flea markets were these one of a kind bronze pieces, not signed, but they were artist pieces. And they were so unusual. And there was something about them that was so freeing and handmade and one of a kind. And I was always inspired by that, thinking like some jewelry designer, you know, like on the coast of Pacific Coast Highway with like some A frame uh, store, you know, just on a jeweler's bench making these one of a kind pieces, a lot of them in bronze because they couldn't afford gold or silver. And you know, inspired, I don't know if they were inspired by these guys because probably a lot of them didn't even know who these guys were. They weren't looking at jewelry books or, you know, going to Paris, but there was, you know, definitely something happening at that time that was so freeing from jewelry went from a very uptight rules, uh, you know, like they had to be, you know, precious stones and diamonds and sapphires and rubies, and they had to be faceted and they had to be gold and it was smooth and then the 60s late 60s 70s especially the 70s all of a sudden everything was just burst out like it was about texture and it was about underwater and tendrils and spores and moss and everything you know pieces that people were finding stones it was like a big time for I know for sure for turquoise where there were turquoise mines in America that were open so these big pieces of turquoise and tur of course cola actually comes from a turquoise mine it's all a copper mine so they were finding these stones that were so beautiful and sculptural and everything went from like sort of being man-made to let's make it just feel like it's just something you found in nature um you know, gold nuggets were a big influence and it, they were so perfectly sculptural and just, you know, God as the designer. And so, yeah, I mean, how can you not be inspired by this? Um, it was like a whole freeing, liberating time where I think that everyone, you didn't have to go to school, you know, to learn how to do lapidary or gems or know what gems were. It was like, just don't go to school and just be free and make things that are sculptural. You can do it, you know, just like Alexander Calder, who was so freeing, you know, he had his, his uh, metal wire in his pocket and he would take it out and like pound something, make some of the suppliers and give it to somebody. That was, you know, it's like this handmade one of a kind thing. So yes, this is very inspiring for me. And being a nature lover, living in California, it's all around. So yes, yes, yes. And I love actually, it. it's uh, it's yeah. I was see, uh, looking at your jewelry, and I saw some um, uh, together with Kimberly. We discussed who we would like to invite as a designer, and we thought about you because you have a few similarities with Andrew Grima, I think, in a way. Uh, uh, your design inspiration from nature, uh, but also in a way um, your uh, clients or the people who wear your jewelry uh, uh, are also the, the rich and famous, just like uh, uh, Andrew Grimas. But also you were actually an inspiration for us uh, for the uh, exhibition design at, uh, at Diva because um, we always make mood boards uh, um, to get an idea about what we want and the story we want to tell with the design of the exhibition. And um, the first room uh, was really about uh, a party and of the, uh, we looked at it of the, the film of Tom Ford, uh, Nocturnal Animals. And uh, we added this uh, photo of uh, Amy Adams. And later on, I was looking at this photo again and I saw that the jewelry actually, the black uh, jade necklace was by you and when I asked you about it and we talked about it. You also said, well, actually, that's not the only thing. There is more of my jewelry in the movie, actually a lot. And maybe also, or not maybe, also a uh, character that uh, just looks like me a little bit in the way of, uh, uh, well, of course, the jewelry she's wearing here is all 
by you, but also the way she looks, the dress, the, uh, she, the way she's dressed, and uh, the curly dark hair. Um, Which so is gray was, now, but yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, but yes, that was yeah. definitely me, animated me, yes, at a party, <laughs> probably too much alcohol at the time, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so that was funny, that circle is run now that we, uh, well, almost finishing with the exhibition. Uh, and we start with one of our first uh, inspirations and that was uh, uh, you actually, or your uh, jewelry. Um, here's some more of your jewelry, um, also a bit of the wild gold. And can you uh, tell us a little, bit, a little bit of the process of your designing and your, the making of your jewelry? Yeah. Um... Well, I think, you know, I guess I, I have been collecting jewelry for a long time. And, um, you know, growing up in Wyoming, turquoise was the first thing you start collecting in because it's what you can afford. I think as a teenager, you know, when there was the rodeos that came around and you go to the Indian villages and you would start collecting your, your turquoise jewelry. And it was always like, you know, your aunts or if you were lucky, you know, a godmother or something would give you turquoise jewelry and you all I always thought like oh that's so cool like when you know that I would have this amazing treasure of turquoise to give to my kids you know this hand-me-down jewelry and I think after being in fashion for so long and spending so much money on clothes one day it was like I was hit over the head with a baseball bat thinking like what am I doing this is so disposable why am I not spending money on jewelry something that I identifies you more and that you can hand down and it's not so disposable and it's just something that doesn't go out of style. So I think at first I was like, you know, buying silver and little things and it was little things just weren't working for me. They just weren't. I'd have this thing and then you'd, even if you had a lot of little things, it just wasn't big enough. So of course the sixties and especially the seventies, um, when things were bigger and things were, you know, costume jewelry was incredible and everything was, you know, little things just didn't work. I mean, you could layer them, but in the end, you want like some big, big necklace and some big earrings and some giant, you know, bracelets. And so um, I think the time, you know, it's hard to do that with gold and precious stones. And so you know, that's liberating. So you start thinking about ways that you can make gold or these pieces bigger and bolder. And a lot of that was, you know, these uh, stones that were just being discovered. Oh, that's where I was going to, you know, like, um, again, mines were, were, were free. So lapis was a big thing. And I mean, mines were opening. Turquoise was a big thing. Citrine, like all of a sudden, instead of all these precious jewels, these other gems and so that you know when you go to Tucson which everyone's like you know when you go to Tucson but it is this incredible experience because once a year you there's a pilgrimage to Tucson that every jewelry designer and gem collector and desert rat you know rock hound and it's this convergence of people from all over the world that bring their gems and it can be meteorites it's fossils it's dinosaur bones, it's it, things that they they just found. or And so it's just this explosion of stones with new ideas. And I feel like that's so much of like what was happening there, this explosion of new discoveries rather than just these faceted, you know, diamonds. Um, and yeah, so like this. Um, these, so this these earrings on the right, I those are gold. I look, work in bronze a lot because I want to be able to, my uh, client to be able to afford it. And working in gold that big, it's really pricey. And also there's something less precious about bronze that you you don't, like when you can travel with it, you don't go like, oh my God, I got to put it in a safe or, um, you know, you just wear it differently. Bronze, there's a freeing thing. And so the but the earrings on the right are gold and the pearls are from um, Northern California and they're abalone pearls. And so they're just really sculptural and this most beautiful color and every single one is different. And of course I love that, you know, these sort of ready-mades that you can find in the earth. I'm working a lot with 
um, gold nuggets now. And that's why I love gold nuggets is because you can just find them or any kind of nugget. It's like the perfect sculpture that you just like, I like no man could make something so perfect. And then the ring on the left, that's um, topaz, which is a really a, a stone that there's only one topaz mine left in Brazil. And this is a puzzle ring that it's two parts that fit together like this explosion of light. Um, and so, you know, once you get into texture and wearing texture, you, it's hard to go back to smooth because all of a sudden it's like things that are growing on you, which I really like. And, you know, it's like moss or something that are, you know, it, you're just, it's like growing on you instead of you wearing it. Um, so. Yeah, and I feel like the 70s was so much like that. Cool. And also you, I found this on your Instagram um, and I really liked it. I really love the, the necklace and it already looks very uh, 60s, 70s to me, but then you really underlined this with the orangey, yellow, brownish background. Um, can you tell us more about this necklace? Well, uh, it's heavy, but I seem to, you know, most of, most of my jewelry is not so light. It's more, I sort of look at it as like armor or, you know, it's something that a, a girl has no problem putting on with what they're wearing if they're into that. And it's just, you know, I, I look at jewelry also as a, a, a tribal thing. It's like, it's not just you're wearing jewelry, you're wearing this sort of armor or this um, talisman of good luck or, you know, it's, it's something that it's protection. And um, this definitely is protection because uh, you could definitely like hurt someone if somebody hugged you too much because the pokey things, but, um, uh, and, and malachite, and this is um, malachite from the Bisbee mine in uh, Arizona, which is closed for a long time. It was like a very famous turquoise mine in Bisbee, Arizona. But again, from tur the turquoise mine, you get um, malachite, you get chrysocolla, that you get quartz crystal, you get all these beautiful stones uh, that are just mixing. You can imagine what that looks like. It's like blues and greens and um and so this uh, malachite is really special. It looks really different from a lot of malachite that's from the Congo. Uh, so, you know, it's all these discoveries of stones that is so liberating that you're just like, oh, I have to. And I work a lot with stones that are just sort of, that's the way they came. Um, so, yeah. Just like in the 60s and 70s. And you, you, this is a drawing or uh, did you make this pattern yourself or? Um, yeah, yeah. I am, uh, I'm not a very good drawer. And so I tend to sort of Frankenstein things together of, you know, with clay and stuff. Um, I find that more liberating, sort of thinking with your hands and like, you know, starting with stones and like, what if we did this and, uh, yeah, so that's how I worked with that. And things around me that you get inspired by. Um, and yeah, so I always knew that I wanted to do texture, but then if, when you're not doing organic texture, there's always like the thing that goes with all that is you have to come down to like a really smooth, large um, sculptural pieces uh, that work with it. It's almost like the opposite. And so this is like a big old citrine giant necklace that I made um, that I love. And they called it in for this, for the Beyonce, Jay-Z, um, Black is King, uh, amazing uh, Disney movie that, that they did, that Beyonce did this summer. And Jay-Z ended up wearing that. And I was like, that is like, the coolest, you know, I didn't make it thinking, oh yeah, this is so good for a rapper, even though in the back of my mind, it's like, that would be so cool for a rapper. But, <laughs> you know, it was, yeah. So he wore it and he bought it and uh, I couldn't be happier. It was like, that was a good moment. Nice, yeah, because I, I made this uh, photos together because I love that your work is so uh, versatile and you have all these different styles. And when I saw this necklace, it really reminded me of the ring in the middle by Andrew Grima, 
which is also in the uh, uh, in the exhibition. And uh, I was wondering how it ended up in the neck of Jay Z, but you already told us. And yeah, amazing that he really bought the the, the piece too. Um, yeah, and citrine was a very '70s stone. Um, you know, a lot of citrine cocktail rings, and you know, it's just, it, it, and I love that that sort of um, you know symbolism or that uh, memory of of the '70s of something that's sort of not used that much anymore. Lapis was super 70s too, which I, you know, love that lapis. Um, and, and then, and, and of course, men and women wearing the same jewelry. So in a way. Uh, yeah. Up yeah. yeah. And then Andrew Grima, of course, was always, has always been, I have some of his pieces and he's been a giant inspiration because um, he was the most, well-known or one of the most well-known of all these jewelers because he had an incredible store in London that I had a friend that went to the store and he said it was like it was so amazing it was all like brutalist you had to like bend down and look inside these little yeah you can see the women this is like in London on one of those fancy streets so you can see those sort of old ladies looking in almost like a cave where you have to you know concentrate and and you know uh and they were all the queen and the royal family wore a lot of grima and so that really broke a lot of boundaries and uh you know he would you know take a uh whatever a stone that you know core a piece of coral or um a big rubelite or malachite and just or a, a, a what do you call it the dollars the um sea dollars or whatever that you find in the ocean sand dollars. Um, sand dollars and he would put you know diamonds around it and he just like nobody everyone was just bowled over and he refined it to a way that wasn't so hippie at all it was more you know just delicious tourmalines and um he was special i feel like he really still influences and a lot of people, all these people that are these designers that Kimberly found, like there's a lot of them that people don't know about at all and just getting to know. So um, she's definitely un unveiled them. And one of them is this Belgian designer, Fernand de Marais. And, I love uh, When we um, talked uh, about uh, what we were, well, about the jewelry of Kimberly's collection, you really said, oh, wow, this piece. And, and what, in your opinion, what does it stand for? What does it tell you as a designer? Well, it's so much about this organic explosion texture, which, you know, it's just, it's so abstract and you can just feel like it's something that's like exploding. And, uh, you know, it's it's not like before, it's, it's not the before part, it's the after where it's just like, explodes and polyps and things are just going all over, you know, like mushroom polyps. And again, the color and that crazy texture, nothing smooth. And yeah, I don't know. That just is like this incredible piece of abstract art. I wonder, do you think it's a bee? Do you think that's a bee? Do you think that could even be a... a oh, an in, in, like in, in, in wax, you know, in the hive? Oh wow! I never saw that. I I I didn't either until just a second. But I'm thinking, hmm. I wonder if it could Maybe. be that. I don't know. I like yeah, the, I think, Oh, I see. It's the bee at the top, of course. You know, I just saw that because I've never seen it in real life. But yeah, of course that is. And it's the flowers. Hot. They're flowers, and then there's the gold of the honey. I don't know. I'm just yeah. I think it's interesting when you look at jewelry. I think what happens so often is you know I'll have a piece for. 10 years and I'll pick it up one day and completely see something different in it or figure out what the artist's intent was. And that's always such a lovely aha moment. I'm not saying we just had it exactly, but it is interesting to kind of- No, except, especially when it's like everyone sees something different and you can use your imagination. Every time you see it, you see something differently. That's, isn't that why you want a piece of art? That's. And also, I think it's sculptural. What Cindy, if, uh, Cynthia said uh, uh, before, really, yeah, it's nice. I also think it's nice to have a 
a Belgian designer here, and since uh, the yeah. museum is uh, yeah. in Belgium, uh, we also talked about um, the, the social and cultural upheaval at the time and how many things changed. And even the Queen of England uh, could be wild with this uh, very nice uh, Grima brooch. Um, I really love it. She still uh, wears it, and she, I think she has more uh, jewelry of, uh, of Grima and uh, also her sister Margaret has a piece that was, well, the story goes that she, uh, it looks a little bit like this one, that she found uh, a piece uh, in the garden of uh, one of the castles and then Andrew Grima uh, used the uh, lost wax technique to make it into a beautiful uh, brooch, but it's fun that, the, the, well, they went really well, but in a, using gold and precious materials um, too. So it was for many people, uh, to wear, but it was also quite a shock. Uh, we talked about this uh, store of uh, Andrew Grima uh, on the left is in London and in, um, on the right is in uh, Switzerland. And as you can see, it's well quite different too than other shops might look like at the time. Um, and here you see more of the jewelry of Andrew Grima. Uh, well, we talked, um, Lisa, you already gave your opinion or your, you talked about the designer and Grima, but maybe Kimberly, you can tell a little bit about why you have so many pieces of him in your collection, because this is just, these are just a few. I couldn't add everything in the, in the presentation. Sure, yeah, well, you know, he, of course, I'm a big, big fan of his work. I was fortunate to meet, fortunate enough to meet him one, one time. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really exciting. And I think that was a real, for me, it was a turning point in my life because uh, I was studying at Sotheby's, I was studying jewelry with Amanda Triassi at, in the Understanding Jewelry class. And as part of our extracurricular, we were given a, a chance to go see a retrospective that Hancock's was having of Grima. And so that was 1995 or six, I think six. And I went, and I just got goosebumps. I walked into this store and I looked around and I couldn't get over it. I saw all these amazing pieces of jewelry and, and I just like to remind people at the time, people were wearing tiny little things, the tin cup necklace, which was a little diamond and a chain and, and uh, everything was white gold and everything was small and dainty. And these big jewels just weren't anywhere to be seen. And so, Anyway, I, some of you that might have seen another one of these videos know, know the line, but uh, I was all giddy and I, the guy behind the counter who was really tall and handsome wearing this cravat looked at me and said, oh, would you like to meet the artist? And I said, absolutely. And he reached across the counter and said, Andrew Grima. And by the way, I did this on purpose. That's an Andrew Grima ring. <laughs> it's a <Malachi>. wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I, um, I, 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 I love his work. And I think it was interesting because he was amongst some of the other um, illustrious jewelers that were happening in, in Britain at the time. Only the difference between Andrew and some of those guys is he was a great marketer. So he really, really, you know, he worked it and, and not only were his designs really special, but he knew how to put his, to, to get out there. He was on to tell the truth and, <laughs> you know, I mean, just all kinds of crazy stuff that he would do. But uh, and there are many, there are some really neat Pathé videos that if you have a chance to, to watch those, they're, they're well worth it. But um, back to these pieces, I just want to say that probably the earliest piece in this group is the one at the top with the sapphires. And you can tell that's a little bit like the queen's piece, um, you know, coming out of a, a more um, classical environment. Then when you get down to the left of the screen or the right of the screen, where you have these, these wonderful uncut tourmalines and a, an uncut topaz, um, those are a little bit later, um, but you can see sort of where he, his designs develop and and um, start looking more like uh, Lisa Eisner's jewelry. <laughs> so yeah. it's- Mine looking like his, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I think too, I, I feel like in the, 
Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Cynthia. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say technically, you know, you see this in the brooch at the top that Kimberly mentioned that has the sapphires. You see it in the ring up the on the left hand side. You see it also, although it's hard to see here, in the necklace in the bottom center. This um, these gold wires that are flattened and laid next to each other and have these characteristic uh, spaces in between them, what he often or others often called what was, uh, you know, they termed shredded gold. Um, and that was a real characteristic of, of some of his work. You see it in the tourmaline brooch on the, on the right as well, but also the square shape of the ring uh, on the left-hand side. So he was, he very characteristically use that square shank on many of his rings. And you know, I feel like, I feel like, oh, sorry. And I there, wanted to say one thing person. about this jewelry. It's like, I feel like if you looked in the dictionary under gaudy, you like all this jewelry, because I'm sure when this came out, I'm sure a lot of women are like, it's so gaudy. Like it's so over the top and just bad takes, which is, you know, there's a fine line between good taste and bad taste. This is so good, but I'm sure that people at first were like, oh, it's too gaudy. So. Oh, absolutely. It was shocking. And, and it's funny looking at these pieces and Cindy, you bringing that up. Um, what's so fascinating is it reminds me of the, the cladding on the storefront with the little tiny square windows that we were talking about. So, yeah. um, and that, that the storefronts were designed by his brothers, by the way, which is kind of an interesting thing to know. But, uh, and there is a really good Grima book out too. I, I'll just point that out for those that are Grima fans. Um, I'm sorry, we have to uh, go a little bit further uh, if I'm looking at the time. We um, have left and all the things we want to discuss more um, because Grima is a very important designer of, of, of the time with this very specific aesthetic, uh, but Van Cleer van Arpels is, uh, yeah, one of the main jewelry houses that also designed, um, well, very, uh, uh, how can I say, um, classical jewelry in a way, but they also started to adapt to what was happening in the 60s and 70s and um, attracting a younger audience, uh, even made own their own boutiques to sell to sell it. Um, Kimberly, can you tell a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So, or, or Cynthia, um, go ahead, Kimberly. Climb in. It's it's Claude. Claude um, no, was it Claude? Um, now I forget which are pals, but in France. So, um, one of the first designers that happens to show in the boutique in the nineteen. 70s is um, I just chime in now <laughs> Jean Mahi. So uh, Jean what? Mahi's uh, first work was actually in the Van Cleef and Arpels window. And as as time goes on, because they recognize that all of a sudden, what's happening is there's this big explosion of these interesting jewels out there in the marketplace, and maybe the big houses don't exactly have that in their store yet. They're lagging a little bit behind, but they're seeing their jet set clientele loving this material. And so in order to catch up, they hire different people to put jewelry in their store that reflects that time. Now, you have to remember they did too also feel like it was important to um, be able to mass produce things. So for example, this manchette, the manchette cuffs here, are produced in an addition of, I think somebody said 50, maybe. Um, I know each one is signed and numbered though. And uh, that was important for these houses to be able to sustain themselves, but they did it in a way that everything looked one of a kind. And we're still trying to figure out who these will buy. Um, I, know, I know someone designed them and we're gonna find it out someday. So, uh, and here you can see, of course, Jackie Onassis wearing them on the uh, other side. And she also had given a pair to her sister-in-law. So she was very fond of them. I think too, what's interesting about some of these larger houses as they're bringing in 
these young designers who are doing um, very different kind of jewelry than that what the bigger houses were traditionally doing is that the bigger houses also created what they called boutiques. So sometimes they were within their store, sometimes they were next door, but they were staffed by women, which was highly unusual at the time. They piped in, mm. uh, you know, popular music and they carried these uh, different kinds of jewelry because as Kimberly said, they saw this, this younger generation really wanting this material. And that's what we see in general is with fashion, with jewelry, with anything like that, that so much of what was happening was coming up from the street. Um, you know, you see it in couture gowns, everyone is lagging behind and then suddenly they're realizing that, oh, I have to get, you know, with it and and create something like is you know like the younger generation is wearing or uh, creating. We see it too now. They are really back in high demand. Uh, the the cuffs of uh, Van Cleef and Arpels were uh, one of them. Of one of the fifty uh, uh, were sold recently in auction in really really high prices. And uh, here are two pieces of Lisa. You you make a lot of cuffs as well. Do you make Pairs too, or are this all single ones? Um, I do make pairs, um, and I like, uh, you know, also, you know, the the one on the left was very inspired by the Native American. It's called a bow guard, like B O W, so it sort of protected your hand from the bow and arrow, and so, uh, yeah, so that's you know, it keeps going back, but yeah, that's. That's powerful, those cuffs, you know, Wonder Woman texture. And again, I can't say enough about texture because it's like everything was so smooth and flat. And then all of a sudden, everything in the 70s was about texture. It's in, you know, again, like just it was so dimensional. And that was important. And then something what, without a lot of texture, very uh, shiny and polished but also a very commercial uh, success, also by uh, a designer hired by a big brand or a big uh, jewelry house, Cartier, um, Aldo Cipullo. Yeah, I think all of you have a lot to talk about, uh, a lot to tell about this. Um, maybe, Cynthia, you, that you haven't had a chance to talk a lot. Maybe you would like to tell a little bit about this, uh, pieces of the, how it replaced the wedding band and well, things. Sure. sure, so Chipullo uh, worked for Cartier for some time and, um, you know, he came, one of the first things he came up with for them was this uh, love bracelet, which was really intended to replace the wedding band. It was, um, you know, they were sold in pairs, they were sold with a screwdriver so that essentially you were supposed to screw it onto your wrist and your partner's wrist and then throw the screwdriver away and you would wear it forever like you would wear a wedding band. For, um, so, you know, it, it becomes unisex jewelry and uh, even though Chipullo himself didn't like that term, we see a lot of what is called, what we call today, uh, unisex jewelry. Uh, in this period, I mean, I have an, uh, an image in the catalog in my essay of Sammy Davis Jr., if you remember him, this great entertainer who is bedecked in gold jewelry um, from his belt buckle to rings on his hand. So you see a lot of men beginning to wear jewelry in this period and really, um, you know, using it a lot. And you see a lot of unisex, those long chains that could have been worn by both a woman with her caftan, for instance, or a man uh, with his very uh, open shirt. Um, so yeah, these are, these are great pieces. Kimberly, do you want to talk about the, the love bracelet? Yeah, well, the, I, I'll just point out that the, uh, the nails, it, it's funny, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the big houses it depends on who it is, you know, not always, but for a long time, Cartier, for example, didn't um, talk about the Chipullo name, not, and about 
2010, uh, Cartier France asked me if they could have a picture of mine that was Aldo Chapula wearing all these chains and necklaces and everything. And I didn't know why. And then I realized later in 2012 that they were reissuing the nail bracelet. And the nail bracelet was first made in I believe 1970 or 71. And um, Cartier was coming back out with that bracelet again. And now it's called Justin Clou. Um, and uh, the Chapulo name is on it. And Chapulo is getting all kinds of uh, accolades now after all this time. So that's really kind of exciting. And the, the nail bracelet was inspired by either one of two things, either the crucifix, because he was a devout Catholic, and I have read an article saying that that's where he got the idea. The second one was, he said he stepped on a nail and he was so angry at it that he wanted to bend it. And so that was another account. So it's probably both of those things, but uh, nice, that, nice that he's being remembered again. And, and I think that's what we're really trying to do with this collection and with the book and with the exhibitions is to give these men and women a place in history that they deserve in jewelry history. So I, I hope that you who are people that are out there watching it now will continue to do research and learn more about some of these fascinating people because it's been a, a really interesting journey for us. And what I really love about one of the uh, talks we had before is something Lisa said. She said, yeah, this is uh, about the love bracelet. This is really classic and, and timeless. It's an icon like a huge chair. And uh, I think it's a wish of every designer to design an icon. Um, yeah, it's, it's nice, I think. Maybe Lisa, you want to tell a little bit? Yeah, about I mean, you know, I think when you talk about Elsa Peretti or Albert or Albert Ch Aldo Chipulo, you know, there's certain pieces I mean, Elsa Peretti, geez, almost everything she did is a classic. And a lot of Alto Chipulas, like the nail bracelet, the fact that they had to reissue it because it's an every, I mean, we were just talking about like, I wonder how many love bracelets that Cartier has sold. I mean, I can't even imagine how many heart necklaces Tiffany has sold. But when you can design as a designer, if you come up with some great idea that becomes a classic of ages, like these guys did, uh, you know, you are, that's, that's it. That's like, it, that's like being in heaven basically. And uh, it's really hard. I mean, clearly it's really hard because I think that's what every designer would like to do. And it's almost impossible to do. And when you see these pieces like Elsa Peretti's too, um, when you see them in life, like the, I have the nail bracelet and the way it's made and it just hinges and then it just sort of magnetically goes together. It's so beautiful. And I must say the old ones are more beautifully made than the new ones. And that's unfortunate, you know, cause you think, oh yeah, they can still make exactly the same thing. It's just a different craftsmanship. It's different. Mm -hmm. Luckily there are still some pieces at auction sometimes. Um, yes. So now we go to the last slide. This is the front of the big catalog that was made by uh, Cynthia and Kimberly and some other uh, people added chapters and articles. Um, I must say it's a wonderful book, uh, beautiful images as well as nice uh, um, new research and interesting interviews and articles. Um, but what I also like is the maker's marks. You put a lot of pictures of all these maker's marks into it. I think that's really nice. And um, Kimberly also uh, uh, told uh, that you really wanted to well, put all the names back on the map and give everybody a, a, a place in uh, the history of jewelry or jewelry history as they uh, deserve. But maybe, um, yeah, maybe because of the time we can they, uh, maybe you both can tell one anecdote or one story of the, the long time of all the research you did about this that you would like to share and a little teaser for everybody to buy the book. Sure. I mean, I'll just say that there's far more jewelry in, uh, in, the, in the catalog than there is, than we showed today. 
and other things that you won't see at DIVA or won't see at other European venues that is in the catalog um, just because we weren't able to send, as Kimberly said, some of the materials um, internationally. But we really accessed through Kimberly's connections uh, a lot of really important scholars in the jewelry field. This is brand new research. You know, there have been individual books. Uh, you know, there was one on Chipulo, there's one on Grima, et cetera, uh, on some of these individual artists, but nothing that puts this time frame in context or these Jew artist jewelers in context. So I think that's really important. And you mentioned the uh, marks at the end, that was a really important um, part that we really wanted to do. Um, so I don't know, Kimberly, if you have other, I'll also just well, mention that the biographical, biographical information on each of the houses and each of the artist jewelers was done by my assist, then assistant, Adam McFarland, and I wanna give him a heads up and, and really thank him for doing all that research. Yeah, and I'd like to thank both Cindy and Adam. They were great, they are great to work with. They're in my own backyard in Cincinnati, Ohio. That's pretty exciting for me. Um, it was tough because I've been collecting this material for a long time and trying to figure out what went into the book and what didn't go into the book. And in hindsight, I may have switched some things around and put more of one in instead of or less of one in and more of something else. And uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is there are still a lot of people out there that aren't included that need their, their due as well. But um, I think we're making, I think the, the exciting thing for me is I'm seeing it come together now. I'm seeing the picture of this. And it's hard when it hasn't been done before, when the books haven't been written and you're starting to write your own stuff. And that's, that's very difficult. So um, as Cindy said, it's, it's, it's the first and uh, hopefully many, many more people will build on this research and, um, you know. Yeah, and I, I just will say, as I say in the introduction, this is a beginning of the discussion. So we're hoping that others will continue the discussion after us and, and continue to research and continue to find out things about some of these artists. Okay, great. Um, well, I will stop sharing. Uh, I will go back to the questions that there might be. Uh, my colleague will help me with that. In the meantime, I will show you a little trailer about uh, the um, exhibition that's on uh, so you can have a little better idea and there's also you can watch the uh, exhibition virtually from your computer if you go to our diva website i will hope you have fun with the trailer um let's see and we will i will come back to questions in 30 seconds Okay, let's see all uh, the questions. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Hello, I can understand. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
there is a question from Lindy Matula, if I pronounce it correctly. Uh, are all of the pieces shown marked with the maker's mark? And a question for Lisa, uh, what does your maker's mark look like? Well, oh, mine's really easy. Mine's just L-E and, you know, not that exciting, but okay, go ahead, Kimberly, sorry. Oh, no. No, I was just going to say, yeah, everything that um, is in the catalog has the maker's mark reproduced in the back of the book. Great. Uh, there's something I forgot to tell you that the exhibition design is by Space Encounters or Beyond Space at the moment. They are wonderful and uh, I can really recommend if you any, every, uh, ever want to have a nice exhibition design, go to them. Um, let's see. Ah, there is a nice comment of Esther Dornbusch. She is Dutch and works for the Rijksmuseum. And she has her own website, hedendaagsesierade.nl. And she says, I would love to write a review on the book of my encyclopedic website. I can send you a copy if you want to send me your, <laughs> your address, no problem. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, here's a question of Stefan. Hello, I can understand that museums prefer to show the finished pieces of jewelry, but the development of a piece of jewelry starts at the drawing board. Many of the sketches were never made into pieces of jewelry, but they show thoughts of the artists. Mm, do, there's nothing um, about sketches in the book, right? Or is it? There isn't, and I don't know. Kimberly, you've got a couple of sketches but not a lot right 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 i only have a couple and uh there believe me i'd have them all if i could <laughs> but um a lot of times you don't have access to that but fortunate enough to have a few uh then an interesting question of julie simpson uh kimberly who are some of the other designers that need to be celebrated oh gosh um <laughs> i well, I'm wearing a necklace by Lisa Sotilas and I, I love her work. Uh, I think it's, it's remarkable. And she, she's also in the book. She's Greek and um, does one of a kind pieces and sold it at Cartier as well. And, um, and I like a lot of the Canadians work. I think that's really good. Um, there's a Schloop and um, Cavalti and Tony Cavalti and Schloop and um, of course we talked about Roger Lucas and um, what about that one woman that you were we the other one we were talking about the other day oh Barbara Anton yes Barbara Anton is is really remarkable and she there are quite a few pieces in my collection by her and she was out of New Jersey and won a number of awards, mainly for her pearl uh, jewelry, but um, also she won some diamonds awards and she was celebrated in newspaper articles and, um, in, and in the press and Vogue and so forth. And, and so I think, yeah, Barbara Anton's work is really interesting too. So there's a bunch of people. I have a new uh, uh, comment from Stefan, the one about the drawings. He said, I've been collecting drawings by goldsmiths for over 20 years now. My collection is already includes 130,000 original drawings by the goldsmith over the past 300 years. Maybe you can <laughs> connect. Yeah. And maybe uh, Stefan has some of the drawings of the designers of um, your collection. Yeah. Be nice. And, oh, and in, incidentally, the Cavalti guy that I mentioned, um, if you do kind of hunt and peck, you can see all the drawings. His archives are online uh, in Canadian archives or something. So you can look at every single drawing of his, which is pretty fantastic. Mm. Um, Great. And then there is a, a comment of Suzanne von Lewe, curator at the Rijksmuseum. Lovely, lovely talk. Thank you all. The small works by Dutch, uh, Dutch artist Anneke Schat in the Rijksmuseum collection would fit perfectly. So maybe Kimberly and Cynthia, if you can come uh, yes. uh, to our side of the world again, please uh, yes. visit the Rijksmuseum's 
jewelry collection it's lovely it's old and um well contemporary i don't know but uh, uh they have uh, a huge um uh, gift from marianne unger with a lot of contemporary jewelry uh what else um here uh um, can we see this the drawing Stefan got you mentioned can we see the drawing collection from Stefan somewhere yes <laughs> uh, my collection has its own homepage um, well I'm not going to grafische uh, sammlungstern.com so you can see in the chat uh, and Julie Simpson says, what's the situation with the Cincinnati Museum exhibition dates due to COVID? Any adjustment? I cannot wait. No, we're, we're scheduled to open to the public October 22nd. Uh, hopefully by that time, you know, we'll be clear and free and clear of COVID, but it goes through February 6th of 2022. So we will and we've been opening exhibitions all along so we are open to the public and we intend to open on october 22nd great then claire pinna asks uh your site uh i assume that's the website of cincinnati art museum the book is sold out where else can i buy well you can buy it at uh, at least what i knew from the website of cincinnati art museum but actually you can buy it on every website or bookshop. Um, yeah, and it sh it shouldn't Amazon. be sold out. So I don't know why it's saying that. I'll I'll double check on that, but yeah. I don't know why. And otherwise, you can check Amazon or any international website. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, any other questions you have? 30 seconds to put them in the chat <laughs> we can answer them um in the meantime i would like to thank everybody for listening to uh this uh very first online diva talk i hope you enjoyed it uh many more to come um we are thinking about recording all the diva talks also the ones that hopefully when we don't have to do it only online uh we are working on our uh YouTube channel. So please follow us when you have the chance to come to Diva. If it's in within two weeks, you are lucky to see the Jewelers Art Exhibition at Diva. If not, there are always other nice exhibitions. And uh, after us, the exhibition, well, only the jewelry, not the scenography, uh, will travel to um, Germany and then to Cincinnati. So also, if you are not from here, you can have the chance to see it somewhere else. And then Kimberly, Cynthia and Lisa, thank you so much for uh, being in this talk and giving all your interesting talks and points of views and uh, details. And um, okay, well, I think that's about it. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. And uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.